Well, hello and good morning to all our listeners from around the world. This is Brian Wesley Johnson, and I want to welcome you to another edition of This Morning with Solivity. I'm joined by some very special friends and beautiful co-hosts, Sheila Applegate and Candace Harper. Good morning, ladies. How are you? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And now feeling beautiful. Oh, well, you are beautiful, darling. <laughs> <laughs> that's why i do the show so someone says i'm beautiful I'm right <laughs> well i will say this every time you're here because it's true 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 um listen th we've got another fantastic show this morning we've got a very special guest that i'm going to introduce uh in a moment and then we're going to talk about some good old hot topics um, but before we begin, um, I want to remind everybody, listen, we want your questions, comments, and thoughts. Just post any question or comment or anything that you want to say about what we're talking about to our Facebook or YouTube chats, and we will get you into the conversation. You can also remember to follow us on, social, on Soul Liberty Magazine at YouTube and Facebook for updates about latest shows that are coming up. So why don't we go ahead and get started? We have... I am so excited. As you guys both know, I love, love, love Black History Month. And we have a fantastic guest um, that is a warrior for racial justice. And I want you guys to meet her. So let's go ahead and meet her. All right. Sinead O'Brien is the director of Racial Fairness Berkshires, a social justice nonprofit in Massachusetts that aims to upend systematic racism locally. Prior to a decade as a civil litigation attorney in Boston, she was a writer and editor in San Francisco, Dublin, and Washington, D.C. The highlight of her current chapter of her life, which includes grassroots organizing and serving on the board of Maryland Media Incorporated, is being a mother to a bright and caring nine-year-old. And so with that, it is my pleasure to welcome to This Morning with Solivity, Sinead O'Brien. Hello, Sinead. Good morning. Good morning. It's so <laughs> nice to be good morning, here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You, you and I have been trying to connect to do this for a minute now. And yeah, so I'm, I, Right? And I'm so, <laughs> so I'm so glad you're here um, because your life and your story um, is the thesis to how to be an anti-racist. And so um, my first question to you is, how did this journey start for you? I mean, can you can you give us some some background and some history? Wow. Well, yeah, you know, I'm let's see, are we doing an extended show today? No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, this, you know, like so I was born in. <laughs> <laughs> Like so many um, things happened, it, it really began during uh, the pandemic when things were kind of shut down. Um, it, it, it was a matter of sitting back and uh, being kind of isolated and talking about mainly in the summer of 2020 when a lot of people came um, came to a realization. And, uh, you know, this had been in the forefront of my mind. I had been an anti-racist, I'd like to think, all of my life growing up in the D.C. area. But... Uh, myself and the co-founder, we were thinking, uh, you know, so many people are coming to this realization and there's a lot going on, but this is going to fade. And what can we do to create something where especially white people can do something and uh, be be proactive, but but have um, substantive change? And we had some time, again, because we were kind of, you know, inside and doing things. And um, I'd had a background of, you know, some, you know, being a being a journalist and being an attorney. And um, I'd taken some time off to be a mother. And I had the chance to really put that to work and uh, start this nonprofit. And it's been it's been slow going, but uh, it's kind of like I like to say it's kind of like a um, roller coaster. It's been like tick, tick, tick to the top and we are really cresting and it's kind of like as we're we're coming around that top and it is a uh, taking off which is marvelous and uh feel very fortunate that's incredible one of the unique things about your organization that i noticed is that 
you said you want it to be of substance. So it's not just about getting people to donate and to do, you know, to give. And I think you even said out of guilt, it's not, a, it's, it's even the frequency with which they donate that you're looking to shift. And so you're doing, a, can you tell me about how you're making that shift so that when people are donating, they're also learning and they're bringing a vibration of welcoming into that donation. Yes. You know, I feel like you rounded all the bases on that. And and thank you for that. It's There's a lot of social justice um, out there. And the most important thing was that we do something different. And again, that we can make a change. And we'd like to think it's a little radical because um, the big thing is that it's two-prong different. Uh, in the first instance, we want to go into the white community and, and kind of expose to them, unpack the realities of white privilege. So white people kind of realize that you can be an anti-racist, but you might still be very passively um, feeding into systemic racism because we mm. get a mm. lot of privilege. We get these advantages that are just bestowed upon us. So in the course of doing that, I hate to use the word educate because it sounds very, um, you know, overarching, but, <laughs> let, you know, let people know. And, and without guilt or without any kind of sense of white saviorism, have them kind of, you know, give up the fruits of those advantages, resources. But most importantly, and I'd like to think that this is also an incredibly different part of racial fairness, we bring those resources back to our distribution committee that is entirely BIPOC, it is entirely wow. minority marginalized, and they decide where those resources go because they are the only ones who can know where to best lift up, level up, fix the problems that these, you know, unlevel advantage systemic racisms are, are, problem, are, are causing. Mm. Sorry, I get, really, I get really fired up talking about it. <laughs> Fashion is good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just curious as, as to how you're starting these conversations because, it, you know, it's it's sort of my experience that there, there are sort of uh, just a couple of over, overarching mindsets where it's, you know, in, in the white community that I know of, and I grew up in a, in a white community as a child, and it's either we don't see color and we're not racist, so we don't really okay. have to do this work, or um, it, it's, I, I am racist, but I'd never admit it, and, you know, I'm denying that critical race theory is important, and I don't want to be in this conversation about any sort of uh, uh, past uh, transgressions or oppression or the history of this country. Like, how do you even come into the room and start this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, that's a great, great point. And, and you kind of hit upon a few things there about, yeah, there's a lot of people who are, uh, they're, you know, they're the closet racist. They're never going to say otherwise. A lot of mm -hmm. people who are anti-racist and um, they're not going to believe ever, you know, their heart, mind and soul, I'm anti-racist. How can I possibly be feeding into the system? Yeah. Um, and one thing I'd like to think, despite all of the naked racism in our country that has been exposed in the past, you know, seven, eight, 10 years, but especially in the past five or six, mm. um, I, I would like to think that we, the flip side is that we are able to have open start conversations about it. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing's for sure, nobody wants to hear that they have white privilege. It is mm. so incredibly, um, it, it's so incredibly important that that is uh, brought uh, with a delicate approach. Um, in fact, when my, my founding group, our founding group, which I'm so proud of, we have the most beautifully diverse group from Berkshire County running from 17 years old to 71. These people are so, talk about passionate. Um, we spent a couple of weeks talking about what can be the proper verbiage so we do not raise hackles, send people running, you know, um, anything but white privilege. And uh, 
Be, because, be, you know, people hear that and they think, I, you know, I was born poor. Right. I was born, I worked hard. I did this. And, right. and people tend right. to really not even understand what it is. Um, but to answer your question, we have a lot of approaches. And, and as I said, we're still really ironing out how to do this super effectively where, you know, we're, we're not flooded with money quite yet. Guys, get your checkbook out, listeners. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we have a couple of um, great, uh, our, our, we have a couple of people on our team who have different um, highlights, expertise and approaches. One of them is presentations. Um, mm. We've done some presentations like locally where it's kind of like, please come, come, listen to how we have really uh, we have very obvious stark um, unlevel problems of uh, systemic racism here in Berkshire County. Mm -hmm. People think of Berkshire County, they think it's it's a, a white, wealthy, mm -hmm. three season um, tourism mm -hmm. town in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, tourism towns like this, they run on the belly of low income and immigrant workers. Those wow. are the ones who keep keep it going. And uh, a lot of people are really blind to that. They are that the people who are, um, the, it's the marginalized, unheard, unseen groups that we really need to open our eyes to and, uh, and work toward getting them the advantages, shifting the advantages, working toward this privileges. So the first thing is, um, to answer your question is we're doing presentations. That's that's one thing, but mm. that can only go so far because you can preach to the willing and you can preach to the open ears. Mm -hmm. The second thing um, that I feel really strongly about is collaborations, working with groups in Berkshire County um, and, and coming together, doing kind of a hub and spoke model um, one thing that I can say about this area is we are rich with um, services. This is a very giving community, um, but I mm -hmm. it's it's it, so we we are we are spoiled with a lot of services for those that need it. However, I think um, one of the problems is that, uh, as often happens, there can be cultural stigma. There can be cultural bias. There can be um, just an inability to reach out and get those services for whatever reason. So we need to work with those groups, collaborations, sister groups, coalitions, and to get those services to the groups that need it. So we're trying really hard yeah. to do that. And and I'm trying to work with um, the community ad advocacy that I had worked on before, you know, reach out to people you know, volunteerism, things, things like that. And, and do your very best there. <laughs> wow. Are you, are you putting out requests to be in rooms where people aren't necessarily in agreement with what your mission is? Are you, are you finding avenues for being able to, you know, present? Yeah. In the, in these communities where it's total denial. <laughs> well, I'll say that's, I, we are definitely putting out requests for that. I yeah. there is nothing more. Um, there's nothing better in my mind. Again, this might be the former attorney in me. There's nothing better than having a really healthy yeah. <laughs> discussion and getting people to gray. You know, black and white is. Uh, there's a gulf between that that is never going to. Um, you're never going to bridge it until you can get people to come together, discuss, and. Um, uh, you know, with with reason and rational conversation. So I would always beg people, no matter what your differences are, please come together, listen, and I will listen to you. I will absolutely listen to anyone who might have the most divergent ideas from me. But as long as we can be very, uh, as long as we can be um, respectful, I'm sure we can come to an understanding. Mm. Wow, this is such a great conversation so far. Um, again, thank you for being here. Um, when we come back, I'm going to ask you specifically, how do you define anti-racism in today's world? Pretty good question, right? All right. Sure. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll be back in about 60 seconds, everybody.
Have you ever asked the question, if I was to be anything, what would I be? Regardless of money, regardless of status, beyond popularity and fame. Living your passion, feeling your life has purpose. Solivity is a space to nurture that which lives in all of us. A place where work can become play and doing what we love creates the dreams of a lifetime. And we want to welcome you back to This Morning with Solivity. We are talking live with Sinead O'Brien, the Director of Racial Fairness in the Berkshires. We got a couple of, of great comments coming in at, you know, kind of asking, answering the question, what is anti-racism? Um, Neil Berry comes in and says, concerns whiteness and anti-blackness in terms of African-Americans. Wow. Thank you, Neil, for that comment. Um, Sinead, how do you define anti-racism and anti-racism in today's world. I mean, things have changed a little bit since the times of the civil rights movement uh, and even before that Jim Crow. So how, how do you define it and why is it important? Great question. Um, and I, it's a very personal question because it is personal to everyone. However, I will answer that because uh, just by virtue of having this nonprofit, I'm putting myself out there. I had with, and being a white woman, you know, trying to expose this problem and, you know, in a very, very uh, small way, trying to fix it um, or disrupt it. I think A, that's my small way of being an anti-racist. Um, just generally, I mean, that's a little bit of a trite answer, but I had mentioned earlier that um, you can be in your heart and mind an anti-racist. Uh, you know, we know that nobody is born racist, nobody is born with hate, but I think that um, we certainly create systems and we create um, societies that make it very easy for young people, children, families to create them. And I think it's really important to um, counter that, to, 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 to teach and train people to be otherwise. And um, most importantly, which kind of goes toward the first prong of racial fairness, is we need to expose what is happening in our society, the passive racism, the systemic racism. When white people are born into a system that gives them advantages that are not merit-based, that gives them things that other colored skin people do not have, um, that's a problem. So being an anti-racist is acknowledging that, teaching others, and doing everything you can to disrupt that continuation. Mm, mm, wow, thank you for that. Candy, mm -hmm. you had a question? Oh, well, I was just thinking in terms of like, you know, we're talking about thought transformation here, right? Like belief transformation. Yeah. 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 Right. So I'd be curious to know, like it, it, when you're doing a presentation and, um, you know, introducing sort of a new paradigm, what is maybe one of the aspects of, of what you use as a curriculum? Like what is something that that you present to people where you'll, you'll get like an aha wow. moment where they're like, well, oh, let me, yeah. that, no, yeah. that's, that's a great, well, that's great. And, and I want to be crystal clear that we are still truly at the um, starting stages. I don't want to, I don't want to sound as though we are further along than we are. We're, we're still working on it. And I, I would love to be able to come back here in a year's time and say, we have fundamentally transformed uh, thoughts and minds here in the Berkshires. But right, right. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is also an important um, point for me to make. When we do our presentations, it is very specifically done by um, the BIPOC people in our group. Uh, mm -hmm. We, I do not feel that I have any standing to stand in front of a room and tell people about um, 
racism or systemic racism or the problems or how it feels to be um, to be in this in this group. I will introduce the people in our group, our founding members. Um, but it is we have a we have a um, there there are, there are people, the men and women here. Uh, one of the gentlemen in our group, uh, he started the Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, chapter in North Adams. We have a, um, a, a Dominican woman who is a social worker here. I mean, she works day and night in, in everything. We, as I told wow. you, we have two, two um, black students in a charter school. They, I mean, they are just, they're rising stars. They do our presentations because they're the ones who can and should speak to this. You know, it's kind mm -hmm. of like, you know, give space for them to talk about this. Right. And it's, for them, they can do the educating, not me. You know, I can be the conduit, I hope. Yeah. But, um, and we do have a lot of spirited discussions, which is marvelous. Um, and very often there's a lot of aha moments. You know, people who've lived here for generations didn't realize that we have a really ugly history of redlining here in Pittsfield, the city that I live in. Wow. And uh, I mean, it's just, people are like, wow, I had no idea. So it's very gratifying to me that two 17 year old girls going off, to, women, young women going off to college are able to tell a, a room full of people who've, white people who've lived here for generations that they might have been living next door to um, redlined neighborhoods. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yes. Wow. You know, I um, heard recently a suggestion of how to help people understand systemic racism that is like stuck in my head. I know. I think it might be interesting <laughs> for you. And I don't know the uh, math of it, but basically it's our, you know, number one capitalistic uh, board game that we have, which is Monopoly. But what you do is everybody starts but one person um, has to wait. It was like eight or 18 turns before they get started. And it, it was a mathematical mm. equation for to oh, cover wow. slavery. Wow. And the, yeah. And oh so you play the game and as it is, and once in a while, someone will roll the dice exactly right and they may win or get close, but you it's just a great visual even just to say that to someone i think like wow yeah, it's, totally. it's, well that's sure. not fair you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the feeling of it right and pick the most racist person to be the one held back. <laughs> yeah <laughs> or not maybe looking from the outside is better i don't know hmm. but um yeah so i had that thought but then i was thinking um as you are going through this in the early in the conversation, you said, you know, I feel like we've been going up a, a roller coaster and we've hit that apex where we're going to, you know, the momentum is yeah. just going to take off. What is that? Not, you know, in numbers or but facts, but what is the movement? What is the the results that make you feel that energy of like this is accelerating? Do you mean what is making me feel that right now or what will make me make me think that we are on that downward whoosh? We are really. <laughs> well, what makes you feel like I'm you're so at the peak? Like what what recent things have happened that you're like, whoa, we're you know, we're near the top now and it's going to take. Yeah. Off. Well, maybe right. it's just well, a um, well, I'll t well, I'll tell you. And I, I hope that uh, I hope that, as I say, my my sister groups here in the Berkshires don't mind my saying it. But we but we've gotten to the point where uh, people are coming to us and people yeah. are saying, uh, you know, we've heard I I've heard that you are doing this and, and we want to hear more about it and we want to work with you. And, and we're getting invitations to um, to speak at with other people and uh, to to do, uh, as I say, kind of like, I, I, lo I love the term coalition or the word coalition because, you know, it's a bringing together, but people are coming, kind of coming to me where it's been very slow going for so long, as I say, and, you know, it's been a lot of, you know, getting together as a nonprofit, doing all the paperwork, getting the people together, drawing stuff. And all of a sudden, uh, people are coming to me saying, I love what you're doing let's work together. Let's, um, let's put together, you know, I keep saying part of this is the 
the presentations, um, which we were kind of couching in terms of discussions and conversations, not not education so much. Like we want because we want people to talk about it. We want to hear what other people think about um, racism, anti-racism, things like that. So um, and and other groups here. And as I say, this is an incredibly um, giving area. You know, it's 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 rich with a lot of other nonprofits. We're we're finding that um, they're very open. They're open to our mission and um, our vision. And I think that that's going to be the way forward because it's only going to work when we all kind of work together. And that's that's how you break down. Um, that's how you break down uh, long term big blocks of things like systemic racism, you know, when you work together and fight it. And when, a, when you come together as a coalition of a community and say, this can no longer stand, this is not mm -hmm. fair. You know, I hate that, that term when you use it as a kind of a, it's not fair, but it's not. Right. So we have to break it down together bit by bit, block by block, voice by voice. Um, <clears throat> since we're coming to the bottom of the hour, um, a question that came to me is based in, listen, we, this is generational and racist teach mm -hmm. racist, how to be racist. <laughs> yeah. So you have this, you have this beautiful child. What are you telling your child about being anti-racist? Oh, well, first of all, you get a million points just for bringing the sunshine of my life into this conversation. <laughs> but um, but if that I am actively, I truly am actively raising him to be um, not just not just anti-racist, but a very kind, caring, um, magnanimous individual. And I think they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, well, you know, Brian, we're friends on um, Twitter. I, yeah. You might see, I, I take him to rallies around here. I, I'm a very, I'm, I'm a pretty active person. He comes with me. He comes with me. He, he, he's nine years old. He makes the signs. He knows that, he knows that to be a caring um, person in a community, you have to be out there speaking out. He already kind of understands that. Um, and that I think is important. If I see something just kind of like on the television or in the on the street that I know is not right, I will say to him, wow, Declan, that's that's not exactly that's not a caring thing to do or or that that wouldn't be fair, you know, to that person. And I think that in the same way, people actively or even passively teach people to be racist or full of hate to another group. Um, it's important, especially now because we have so much division in our country to do our very best to be actively teaching kindness and fairness and joy and love for everyone in this way to our young people and our old people i'm sorry yeah, our yeah. older generations let them know that they too can change yeah nice yeah wow Sinead, thank you so much for being here um, listen i can't thank you enough for listening to me i <laughs> this has been so marvelous well again i mean it, it you know you're part of this village where you're taking responsibility and being the change that you want to see. And I think a lot of times um, people who are, are non-minority um, think that that's just a black thing or that's just a, you know, Latin thing and they need to fix this. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's not how racism works. That's not how discrimination works. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> and so again, thank you for being here. Would you come back? And talk are more are about you this? kidding me? Are you? I'm <laughs> my, my, I will have an. I, I will keep myself wide open. <laughs> Truly, this is the highlight of my day, my week, my month. Thank you oh, so much. Wow. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Well, Sinead's going to stick around for our hot topics that's coming up at the bottom of the hour. You can find out more about Racial Fairness Berkshires by going to their website at www.racialfairnessberkshires.org. 
And you can contact Sine directly about everything that's going on in racial fairness by emailing her at SineRacialFairness at gmail.com or give her a call at 413-727-1899. So we're going to take a quick break, everybody, and we'll be back with more This Morning with So Liberty. Six years ago when I started So Liberty, my vision was to support everyone in improving their life through the discovery of their passion and purpose so they could become the best version of themselves to battle fear and ignorance and create a better world today. Get inspired to live your passion and purpose. Visit Solivity.com now. And we are back with more This Morning with Solivity. I am joined by my beautiful co-host and friends, Sheila Applegate and Candace Harper. Good again morning, ladies. <laughs> Good, again, that, that didn't come out right. Good morning. Ladies. How are you? Good morning. We're going to have a more, more, more coffee. More <laughs> coffee. It's okay. Um, it's, it's time for Hot Topics. Mm-hmm. Um, did you guys see the Grammys last night? We, I we didn't see, see it live. Sunday night. Or oh, Sunday night. I'm sorry. Yes. On Sunday. <laughs> yeah, see? Everything just kind of blends together. Right? Um, Trevor <laughs> Noah was fabulous as always. Yeah. I love how he he's basically was talking about that these are the sounds of humans. I mean, that that he just brought everybody together as a diverse and inclusive community around music. Um, just to let everybody know, um, if you didn't watch it and you don't know who won what, so happy that record of the year was about damn time yeah. uh, by Lizzo. Yeah. Um, the album of the year was Harry's House by Harry Styles, who's that's a fantastic album as well. Um, song of the year was Bonnie Raitt, mm-hmm. uh, just like that. Um, that's a fantastic song. Um, and the best new artist was Samara Joy. Um, so oh, go check out amazing. those folks. Oh man. Just a, a quick shout out to a brother who actually I interviewed about a couple of years ago, um, who is a fantastic spoken word uh, poet and artist, Jay Ivey. He mm-hmm. won his first Grammy nice. for um, The Poet Who Sat ne- By The Door, which is a tribute to Langston Hughes. He was for a uh, best spoken word poetry album. So I'm doing a little shout out to my boy there. Maybe we can get him back on, ladies. I mean, yeah, you know, and yeah. have him on this morning. What did you guys think about? I mean, what what were some takeaways that you guys have about that? I'll go to you, Candy, first. So, you know, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Like, first of all, I used to be someone who like loved award shows, like watched every <laughs> single one of them, like especially yeah. when I was worked in the entertainment business and you know being young and aspiring to to being an entertainer and you know watching it in my ripe old age now (laughs) i'm always i'm always amazed at the combination of first of all just like you know new new musicians and trying to wrap your mind around how some people are this famous (laughs) right right so just like you know watching overall the the human behavior aspect of it because there are there were a lot of artists in the room that i also love and enjoy and i was excited about lizzo winning and um it spurned me to think about like this whole idea of fame and how important fame is in this country because i like to watch human behavior and a lot of the observations that i was making was just how uncomfortable a lot of people seemed. <laughs> <laughs> In particular, Beyonce. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm a Beyonce fan, right? But there were a couple of things that I noticed. Well, she was she was late, and there was some sort of acknowledgement of that. And I think one of the uh, whoever accepted her first award made some comment about CP time, <laughs> and then. <laughs> When she got there and the camera was on her, I just was like kind of watching her. And I was thinking to myself, like, when you're at that level of fame, and I feel like culturally we're such a, uh, you know, 
this desire for fame, this, you know, especially among young people, mm-hmm. I wanted it when I was young. I feel like because of the internet, young people nowadays, it's almost like they feel like their life won't be a success without it. Right. And I think about, you know, artists like Michael Jackson, oh. you know, as an equivalent to that level of fame that Beyonce has. Like, how do you even function? Like I, I felt sort of an, an empathy for her. And it doesn't sound yeah. crazy because she looks like she has everything. Right. But you know, I'm watching these people and I'm watching even like Lizzo. She was so cute because she's she's she acts like a fan in the seats. But like an Adele, like I'm like, how do you even function when you're just so constantly either vilified or worshipped or expected to be something? Like your every move is being observed. And that's what I was getting as I was watching Beyonce in particular. Like she looks like someone who's every single like movement of their finger is <laughs> criticized. Her right? <laughs> Woo! You know, like how do you be that person while also enjoying the fruits of being rewarded for your passion, you know? Like you can't deny that. What about you, Sheila? What were you thinking about this? Oh, should we stay with this topic or you want me to save my thoughts on the Grammys? Yeah, let's let's do it. Where are you going with it? it, The world is your oyster, my dear. (laughs) Well, let's save it here and then I'll tell you my thoughts later. (laughs) um, I I mean, with the fame thing, Candace, I think that's such an important thing to notice. And I think it's really... um, astute of you to be watching from that perspective because we have this real dichotomy in our world and fame has been something that I've kind of thought about a lot as far as not big fame like that but you know I've had a mission to bring consciousness higher consciousness to the world and to normalize communication with the divine which is kind of on the sidelines, right? But there's been this drive even during my career, like, and I think this goes for all of us here. Like there's this feeling like, well, we have to push because we have to reach more people and to reach more people, you have to become known. And so not that I reached anywhere near the people on the Grammys, but I've had this, like, do I want to be a public figure? Do I not want to be a public figure? How can I serve the best? And then that constant trying to remember, like, why am I doing this, you know, and keeping my soul and myself. And this is like, you know, an ant kind of compared to the figures that they're experiencing. <laughs> right. So I would just assume that it's just so amplified. And we've seen it over all of Hollywood, you know, if you look through um, the generations in we we know that it can destroy people. So anyone who is holding on to their truth amidst that and still offering us these gifts, I think we just have to like bow down to. (laughs) Well, Sinead, you're here. So what do you think about like this obsession with fame that America has? I mean, yeah, you know, I, first of all, this is such a rich topic. I, I think that, um, on an evening when we could have been celebrating uh, the representation of the winners. I mean, it was, uh, Woo! hello. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that, it was a great night for that. And as we had talked about uh, earlier, when we were just chatting that the next morning, it was, p- p- there was so much sniping and nastiness Uh, you know we talked to everyone's kind of talking about ben affleck not even a performer you know everyone's making jokes about he's a he's a meme now because he just didn't want to be there he was the husband dragged to the show because he had he should have been alert at every moment and had a smile on his face he didn't but to go to what candace said it the audience becomes its own almost like exhibit there they the entire time the cameras were swooping in to watch what the audience is doing when when they could have been on the stage watching the performers but the audience itself became its own bizarre performance art um so we could sit and not do what we're doing i hope we're i hope we're giving it its own due but um it is it's a it's a almost a twisted way we're, we're looking at it. I'm old enough to remember when Madonna was on the Grammys revolutionizing right. the performances. Yes. And yeah. on Sunday night, she went on there and all anyone could talk about was that she, like her age and how she, how she might, how she looks now. And that makes me almost angry. 
it's <laughs> what are we doing? This is not this is no longer about performances. It's about how we are viewing people and I don't know. I'm just I'm so bothered by it. <laughs> you, you know, I'm I'm glad you know again th this whole thing is it's like there's some intersectionality here that yeah. we're talking about as well. Um I, you know, yes, everybody, you know, I'm I'm so glad Lizzo won and and you know, but we don't even talk about her journey. I mean, and and the importance of where she, how she went through everything that she went through to get to where she is today. Um, mm -hmm. I will mention just, you know, shout out to 313 Detroit because she was born in my hometown. So no, she's a she's a Motown girl. I mean, she moved to Houston <laughs> later, but you know. Yeah. Um, but the 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 amount of we talked about this yesterday on Tammy Talks. The amount of resilience that she had to have yeah. to stay true to her passion, herself, and what she wanted to do. Because she's been, I mean, when she played that flute in at the Library of Congress, people lost their mind. Yeah. Yeah. They lost their mind. All that resilience, but also willing to just like what was so cute about her is that she's just a fan. Of, like she was a fangirling at the table. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> like everything that she, you know, she has accomplished, she still uh, shows up with uh, uh, at least an air of um, humility. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, it's yeah, it's just she interesting. And we we saw that um, again talking about obsession with fame. Um, She's had, I guess she's had a boyfriend for a long time and, and nobody really knew. There was no pictures of him. Mm -hmm. And those, again, somebody found out <laughs> and they debuted them. And now that's a story. Oh, Lizzo has a boyfriend. It's like, okay. Right. <laughs> okay. It's, I saw this. Um, I don't know if you guys ever uh, uh, go to the School of Life website or watch any of the, the school of life shorts they have on youtube mm -hmm. they just talk about different things and they did one on fame and there was this little blurb that i want to share with you guys because i thought it was really interesting talking about how uh culturally you know how fame shows up and you know how, what's going on with young people around fame today and it said, at a collective political level, we should pay great attention to the fact that today, so many people, particularly young ones, want to be famous and even see fame as a necessary condition for a successful life. Mm -hmm. Rather than dismiss this wish, we should grasp its underlying worrying meaning. They want to be famous because they are not being respected, because citizens have forgotten how to accord one another the degree of civility, appreciation, and decency that everyone craves and deserves. Wow. So I thought that was very interesting is that, you know, we have we have this craving for, you know, fame and attention and, and all of that because we do believe that it's going to be something that that affords us what we really want, which is that love and acceptance, that appreciation. And I think in watching the Grammys, watching people in these situations, it's what we're watching is a uh, study in in human yeah. say say again oh i just i just said yeah <laughs> sorry oh, okay. <laughs> just i'll say yeah there. too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> amen mm. a, a study in, in human need right and and how you know the fame itself like what Sinead was pointing at it ends up being a lot of scrutiny and how the fame itself is not that thing but we no. think it is it's that drug Right. But it, but, you know, to go back to the importance of it, like I think that it, it, it is important to be able to uh, be passionate and be purposeful around your craft and be doing what you love. And I think that that's what's admirable more than anything, that there are these people who like Lizzo, who just do what they love and are able to touch so many people. And we want to never lose sight of that's what's at the heart of it rather mm -hmm. than, you know, what they're wearing or what they look like or you know, all that stuff. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a quick break. This was a, another great topic, but I think we're going to stay on this, but in a different way with Sheila. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in about mm, 60 seconds. Hi there, Sheila Applegate here with some exciting news. 
I've joined the incredible Soul Liberty team as the host of the new Consciously Awesome live show, where I will be sharing insights to help you discover your full brilliance and claim the vibrant life you deserve. So tune in every Wednesday right here on Soul Liberty TV to join the fun and Remember to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss a single episode. Have an awesome week, and I will see you on Wednesday. And we're back with our final segment of This Morning with Solivity. I'm joined by my guests, Sheila and Candace. We're talking about um, the Grammys, but our reactions to the Grammys that were this past weekend. And Sheila, you had a very special uh awareness that came in as yeah you so for those of you who know me or have watched my show you probably know that um the transgender community is very dear to my heart so i was filled and wanting to focus a little bit on kim petra who um she and sam smith won the best pop video for unholy they also performed at the grammys and she is the first transgender woman to receive a Grammy. Um, and when she was receiving it, Sam had her receive the um, award and speak because of this. And she talks in her acceptance speech about thanking her mom. She thanks many people who have supported her, Madonna included for supporting the LBGTQ community. But then she talks about how she grew up um, on the side of a highway in Germany and that her mom supported her and believed her when she said that she was a girl at a young age and that that made such a difference. So I just wanted to ask you guys what, you know, what have you had experience? Do you have people close to you that have um, are transgender or non-binary? And if I know we have to imagine, I know uh, you, Brian, could be thinking now of your little grandbaby and oh, we know yeah. that she made, you have a, chi a child. And what, what would you be like as a parent or how do you help communicate that you are supportive? And then I have some ideas of how we can. Mm. Um, <laughs> I think I'll start by saying... Um, the uh, did you guys watch the series this is us yeah Some of that. Yeah. yeah there was a very beautiful and and, and i love that show because they just they just dove dove in deep into a lot of different topics where um there the 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 black couple that was on the show had two daughters and then three but the mid age daughter was coming into awareness that um, she wasn't sure yet about her sexuality and that her parents were kind of assume, you know, before this, their parents were kind of assuming, you know, um, that she was heterosexual and that she was going to be dating boys and this and that. And she got to the point at which she expressed herself to her parents that, listen, I'm not really interested in that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and they had to go within and understand that that is their child and that their child has the right to express herself in the way that she wants to express herself specifically as it comes to her understanding her sexuality and her beingness and they and there was a beautiful I, I, if I find the episode, I'm going to post it where they sat down with her. And basically the whole thing was. When it when as you're going through this process, we are down with you, no matter what that is, no matter what decision you make, we love you you in whatever way that you are expressing yourself in that way that the you that we see our child we saw our baby girl or baby you know or baby boy whatever you whatever it's going to be 
we that's what we see and it was just total acceptance and it was hard for them because they had to challenge their own belief systems but i think that's how i would approach it i think that that would be you know staying in 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 a realm of acceptance and letting my child know that i love them period finito <laughs> wow nice do, may I? Do you mind if I um, pop in here? Absolutely, yeah, please, please, please. <laughs> please. Okay, I think this is a very interesting topic to me um, because uh, I, I, my son and and uh, his dad and I split time, right? And I think uh, I think you can uh, appreciate that I am a very open, understanding. I, I teach my son from moment one that. Uh, love and appreciate everyone right and uh from the time he was about two years old he uh was a very artistic little boy he he liked uh to wear makeup he liked to try on different clothes and uh whenever he comes to my house every other you know two days he knows this is his safe spot and he has a spot he has a, a dress up Clo uh, dress up. Um, he dresses up here, if you know what I mean. Uh, right, you know, right. but uh, that's kind of waned in the past year or so. Maybe as he's gotten a little further into elementary school. But the difference that uh, that I think is, I feel like I have to work almost overload uh, to let him know how okay it is, no matter what he feels growing up to never tamp it down to if, if those feelings kind of stay, if they might just be artsy boy, but um, because I think parents might not always feel the, feel the same, act the same, respond the same. And sometimes one parent might really need to um, be a little overarching in how they kind of Brian, like you were saying, like it's, it's one thing to let your child know, but if you have another parent who might be pushing against that notion or, or making a child feel shamed, mm -hmm. oh, it's so hard. It's so, hard. do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. so, uh, I, mean, I, mean, yeah, I, love I love what you're saying because, um, it does start young and that acceptance of whatever is going to be. And I, I get what you're saying about the other parent. If an, if one parent isn't accepting, you would work extra hard. I think it even goes to all of us because our society isn't naturally accepting of it. So, you know, this consciousness of can we work hard as a society right from the beginning to be aware of how binary we are in our genders. And mm -hmm. I love that you're letting your child, you know, dress up and, um, and express themselves in any way. So I'm a strong advocate of letting us experience and, and be aware of how often we use binary language or default to that type of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Sheila, you know, um, this, this topic kind of touches my heart <clears throat> because, you know, we're teaching, we're giving the gift of really unconditional love to our children and letting that be our guide in mm -hmm. parenting them. And I know that in situations like Sinead that you're in where one parent is a little bit more accepting than the other or more, a lot more accepting than the other. I think it's really, really difficult. I think, but the point of it is, is that that child has the choice still at the end of the day even with the differences that they can choose which is which is i guess what we're trying to teach right when it comes to their beingness they get to choose how they want to be you know right and that they're loved unconditionally and that even they're loved for the parent yeah, who can't understand it yet if the love keeps showing you have time to get there yeah. I just think about like if I, I'm not a parent, so I don't necessarily comment on what should or shouldn't be done parenting wise. But I just think that if I would have had a child, let's say 20, 25 years ago, I know that my um, my paradigm around transgenderism at that time would have probably limited and also, you know, where I was on my own growth 
would have limited my ability to be able to be graceful about it. <laughs> right, right. I'm not saying that I would have rejected my child by any stretch of the imagination, but to have the grace to to you know know how to allow and and be accepting of what a child wants. I think that the reason that we're in this sort of, of space right now is it, it really is not specifically about gender. It's about our society being tested to understand grace with each other. Ooh. And who mm -hmm. more important to develop grace with than our children? And I think part of the reason that we struggle as a culture is because our children haven't been given grace. Like I, I'm Generation X. So we definitely don't feel like we were given any grace. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> right? But I feel like that's what this is about. Like in the grand scheme of things, whether it's the gender of your child or whether they're LGBTQIA or whether, you know, they're biracial or whatever, overall, the, the lesson is grace and learning how to have a sense of uh, humanity when it comes to our, you know, in our own home and practicing that and what challenges your ability to do that mine would have been very challenged at you know 30 years old whereas now if i were to let's say adopt a child i probably would be a lot more sensible about it for sure and be able to give that grace wow you know that's a whole topic we yeah, need to just no, expand we need to expand yeah we just need to <laughs> expand on that because we could go another hour well maybe in the right? future we'll be able to go another hour um <laughs> Wow. This has been a fantastic show. Um, once again, I want to thank our very special guest, uh, Sinead O'Brien from Racial Fairness Berkshires. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you've got to come back. We've got to continue. And you got to join yeah. us for some more hot topics because you, you just <laughs> fell, up, fell right on in. Yeah. Some good, good stuff. You guys are great. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, while we have time, I just want to make sure that people know about the different uh, uh, services that we are providing you at here at SoLivity.com with our beautiful co-host. Notice I said that word again because you are. <laughs> um, Candice, you've got some things that you're still doing uh, and that are all about building healthy relationships. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I work with uh, professional BIPOC plus women around creating a love life that loves us back. So um, I do that through helping heal the past, love ourselves unconditionally, start over from a clean slate. If you're a Solivity listener, you can work with me in my one-on-one -on -one 12 week intensive. It's called Love Life Skills for Leaders. And if you use the promo code SOLIVITY50, you'll get half off the cost of working with me if you um, are a listener, use that code and get in touch with me and have a consultation. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, be go get it. Y'all right. better go get it, y'all. <laughs> um, Sheila, you you know, you've got this wonderful series that you do every month called The Matrix of Illumination. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's the next one's coming up very shortly. It's coming up tomorrow, the eighth hey, of hey. every month. And so tomorrow evening, and it's only $22 to join in. I do a live event on Solivity's Aspire and the Matrix of Illumination. We come together, the people who show up um, help influence where we take the direction of it. And we do, I do a guided meditation and then I open up to the divine to bring in information and share some insights that are pertinent to us today. So that's um, tomorrow night. And I hope you'll join me. And if you can't be there live, there are recordings so you can still sign up. And tomorrow, because it's Black History Month, aren't you doing something special? Yes. Uh, I, I want to honor Black History Month. And when I say I bring in the divine, I am a channel. That means that I bring in different energies to speak uh, through me. And so I opened up and it could change because I'm just going to put it out there for who wants to show up. But I did think of um, Harriet Tubman, who I have channeled before, and then... Um, we were talking about Einstein yesterday and, and his role in it. So I think those would be fun. And if you're not sure about that channeling and that idea, it, if you just want to believe it's my imagination that it's their energy and listen to the words that come in, I'm cool with that too. <laughs> wow. Well, listen, uh, listen, everybody, you can find out more about the great shows that are coming up here with this morning by going to our 
uh, landing page for this morning with Solivity. Also, remember, follow us on social media. And while you're at our website, subscribe to our mailing list so that you can find out more about what's going on at Solivity.com. Um, listen, we're almost out of time. I just want to say on behalf of all of us here, uh, I want to say thank you for joining us for another episode of This Morning with Solivity. Uh, we hope that you come back and join us every weekday at 8 a.m. Eastern or watch the replay at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, until next time, keep on having real conversations with passion and purpose and create that great, high quality life today. We'll see you next time. Bye. This work is subject to copyright owned by Affinity Global LLC. Any reproduction or republication of all or part of this is expressly prohibited unless Affinity Global LLC has explicitly granted its prior written consent. All other rights reserved.